Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome back. I'm very excited for tonight's online concert. I should have thought of doing this some time ago, really, but with the passing this week of the great Max Marath, I decided it's time to do a virtual concert as a tribute to Max Marath. And so we're going to be talking a lot about Max tonight. But as usual, join me in the chat and ask for requests and so forth. Um, I'm probably going to stick mostly to music that's associated with Max, but I imagine many of my listeners may have even known him personally. Let's get things going with one of the tunes that Max used as a signature song for many years. It was written way back in the year 1900. And here's the original copy. I'm certainly living a ragtime life. And since I don't sing, let me read you the words. And this fits uh, the late Mr. Morath perfectly. I've got a ragtime dog and a ragtime cat, a ragtime piano in my ragtime flat. Wear ragtime clothes from hat to shoes. I read a paper called the Ragtime News. Got ragtime habits and I talk that way. I sleep in ragtime and I rag all day. Got ragtime troubles with my ragtime wife. I'm certainly living a ragtime life. so much. Well, that's a fun start to tonight's program. And uh, looks like everything's working online. Already got 80 viewers on YouTube. Thank you, folks. 
<clears throat> well, I will certainly tell a few stories about Max Morath during tonight's concert from personal experience and otherwise. I did have the pleasure of uh, a close friendship with him for the last 15 or 16 years. And I'll tell you more about that as we go along. And as it relates to the music I'm going to play tonight, um, Max's first recordings were made in Cripple Creek, Colorado, when he was working uh, at the Imperial Hotel in the Gold Bar Room and at the melodrama they had there. And I have what I believe to be one of the only surviving 78 records that Max made uh, around 1954 or thereabouts. The same recordings were released on 45s, so these have been digitally transferred by collectors, but Max told me that he believed all of the 78s were destroyed and he did not have any more of them. And uh, lo and behold, I found one in the collection of uh, another friend of mine that has since passed away, Mike Montgomery. And it's Maple Leaf Rag on a 78 record, so, something else on the other side, played by Max Morath. Anyhow, um, I loved Max's early records. I think they're great and kind of fun in a, in a sense. They're not as serious as his later work. Um, he was very clear with me that he was not proud of them because they were not done on good pianos. They were done on what you might call rinky-tink style uh, pianos. Um, <clears throat> but I'm still going to play a few things inspired by those early recordings. And one of them, uh, he had done a number of records uh, in Cripple Creek already, and he did one called More Marath, which is one of the first ones I found, uh, ironically, I think, at an antique store. And I just absolutely loved it. And I believe Max was one of the very first people to record Carbarlic Acid, one of the fun, fun rags from the year 1901. Uh, I know he recorded it a year before Bob Darch did. This was 1959. So let's do Carbarlic Acid, a hot rag. so much. Carbarlic acid. Someone is asking, was Max playing in Cripple Creek in the 1970s? And I believe the answer would be no. By that time, Max had a much larger concert career and did a lot of TV shows and so forth. Um, 
one of the great things about Max was not only his pianistic ability, but uh, his concerts where he would tell the uh, entire history of the ragtime era. And I also think he had one of the very best voices for singing ragtime songs. There are very few people who seem to do that convincingly, especially in the second half of the 20th century. So Max was one of the best when it came to singing in the ragtime style. And so here's a, one of the ragtime pop songs that I have always loved. And Max recorded this early on in the 1950s when he was still working in Cripple Creek. The song dates from 1903. It's an Irish flavored ragtime tune called Bedelia. Or Bedelia, I want to steal you. So much, Bedelia, a tune from the early ragtime years, 1903. <laughs> For a while, I thought the song was Bedelia, I want to kill you. No, no, I want to steal you. <sighs> oh, and Leo also asked why Max's 78s were destroyed. I don't know that they were destroyed on purpose. Um, the end result, as I understood it, which is, was just that none of them survived. Again, the same exact recordings were released on 45s, which I have, and I've digitally transferred them. But it's just, it's just uh, neat to think that Max Morath's career, uh, who, and he only passed away this week, but his career started on 78 records. <laughs> oh, he, he sure was wonderful. In fact, I think he was probably one of the most well-known ragtime musicians in history, r right up there with Scott Joplin and Yubi Blake, perhaps. And um, I'll, I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Uh, uh, there were other musicians who, who uh, sold millions of records, outsold Max, well, I think, had a huge following. But uh, as I learned more about uh, the music business in the past, um, I think that Max reached more people uh, in particular because he did a lot of TV work in the 60s. He had two television series in the late 50s and early 60s, two different shows 
all about the ragtime era on NET, National Educational Television, which was a precursor to PBS. A lot of people around today still remember that. Um, Johnny Maddox did TV in the 50s, but they were sparse appearances like on the Milton Berle show and uh, Patty Page show called The Big Record. Um, I think Max's appearances in the 1960s, which was a little later on, and even after that, uh, on television made him almost even more of a household name. And um, he was a regular on the Arthur Godfrey show and the Bell Telephone Hour and some other shows that are still well remembered. Um, so with that said, usually after the first couple of tunes, I will make an announcement that I do accept virtual tips for these concerts. I might have some new people with me tonight, so just in case, there is PayPal and Venmo information in the postings on all three websites. Let me check Facebook. I haven't checked Facebook yet. Oh, it looks like there's some spam uh, here on Facebook of some kind. Sorry about that, folks. And it looks like Max's daughter, Kathy, said she just had to leave early. I know she was going to be listening tonight. Um, and I haven't been able to... to uh, I haven't even had time to contact his wife, Diane. I hope she's doing all right. We'll see, said the blind man. Well, let's get right back onto the concert. And I'm going to play for you a piece that Max used as, again, one of his signature tunes over the years. He used it on one of the radio shows that he produced, and I have never played it that many times, but we're going to try it tonight. Written in 1906 by Adeline Shepard from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, who was about 18 years old at the time. Let me show you the original sheet music cover. Pickles and Peppers Rag by Adeline Shepard. And Max will often point out that uh, this, this piece was used by Williams Jennings Bryan, the only man to run three times for President of the United States and fail. So maybe, maybe his choice of music wasn't so great, but I think it's a fun upbeat piece, Pickles and Peppers, a rag oddity, according to machine music.
pickles and peppers. Thank you very much. <sighs> well, I'm reading a little bit of the uh, chat here on YouTube. It sure would be nice if all of Max's early PBS shows could be digitally transferred. Um, I have many letters from him where he explains some things to me. Uh, I forget where they are in storage. It might be the University of Maryland. I, I heard that recently. And um, one of the issues is they don't really know how to transfer the original film. Whatever kind of TV film was used at that time, around 1960, they don't know how to transfer it without destroying it. So that's um, why the shows have not been transferred. I was delighted to see there was a really big and wonderful article in the New York Times about Max, which seemed to appear within 12 or 24 hours of when he passed away. It makes me a little sad that I didn't try and submit something to the New York Times on Johnny Maddox. Um, Johnny had a star in Hollywood Boulevard, in which Max did not, and um, it's funny to me that someone with uh, accolade like that would not, his <laughs> obituary would not be in the New York Times. But anyhow, um, let me tell you a little bit about how I first met Max. I promise I'm not going to talk all night, and we're, I've got lots of fun things to play for you, but um, I did not meet him, unfortunately, until after he had retired. I was playing here in Durango at the Diamond Bell Saloon with Johnny Maddox. I had flown out to Durango, Colorado to visit him and see him play when I was 13. This would have been 2005. And um, my parents and I flew home. And the next day, I got a call from Johnny who said, guess who walked in the saloon and kissed me on the cheek? Max Barath. <laughs> and um, I had no idea that Max was performing at the former Diamond Circle Melodrama the next day. I missed Max's last one-man concert by one day, and I'm still kicking myself for that. He did do one or two other performances afterward. I think they may have only been like uh, vocal uh, performances with a band in New York, but his last true one-man concert of the famous Max Brath style was here in Durango, and by coincidence, his first one-man show was also at the Diamond Circle Melodrama in the 1960s. So that is a special connection that Max has to uh, Durango, where I live. And so then, of course, I, I realized I need to get in touch with Max. He's, he was probably the most important ragtime musician that I had not yet had the chance to meet and get to know. And so um, I started an email correspondence with him, well, maybe when I was about 15, and I remember one of the first emails I received from him was right before I went to a play in Hungary with John Arpin for the first time. That was very special. And then a few months later, my stepfather Scott and I flew all the way to Duluth, Minnesota, mostly so I could meet Max. I also played in a concert at um, the Ragtime Festival they had in Duluth, Minnesota. Uh, but uh, really the reason I wanted to go was to meet Max, and we spent about three hours talking in his favorite um, malted milkshake shop. And so uh, that was a very special memory the first day that my dad and I met Max, and he became a very good friend for the next 15 or 16 years. And um, in fact, I don't think it hurts to say it uh, at this point, especially since he is now gone, he is the one that helped me get the gig at Carnegie Hall when I was there as well. He uh, sort of recommended me for the job. So I owe Max a lot. And uh, in tonight's concert, I'm certainly going to play a few of his original compositions, too. They are among my very favorites of the ragtime revival years. The newer ragtime pieces, Max's music is melodic. It is pleasant to listen to. It's original, yet it harkens back to the original ragtime period in many ways. One of the uh, ones that I like the best is called the Gold Bar Rag, named for the Gold Bar Room in Cripple Creek, and I'm going to play that for you now. Uh, my rendition includes a section of the music that was on Max's original recording of the piece that did not make it in the printed sheet music, and when I played it for Max, he had completely forgotten that he wrote this extra part for the piece of music. <clears throat> Anyhow, here's Gold Bar Rag. 
Max Morath. <laughs> much. Isn't that a great piece? That one dates to at least the late 1950s. Um, a few years later in the 1960s, uh, I'm sure it was published in one of Max's music folios, and uh, actually that's one of the important things that Max did in his career. Early on in the 1960s, he helped republish many ragtime music scores in music folios, uh, because at that time you could not just go online to Google and search one of the digital sheet music archives and print off a copy of any of the Scott Joplin rags. The music had not been in print for nearly 50 years. So that was one of many of Max's pioneering efforts that were so important. And, um, you know, he stuck to ragtime pretty closely throughout his life, and it's remarkable that he had such a successful career doing primarily traditional ragtime era music. Uh, he did certainly play a little bit of early jazz. He made one album called Max Morath in Jazz Country, which I think is really great, and I used that. Uh, shall I say, I borrowed it for one of my virtual concert titles as well. <clears throat> now, let's see. I do want to ask for requests tonight. I'm going to play more of Max's compositions later in the program. Uh, please go ahead and send in the requests that you may have uh, right now, and I'll check the chat on all three websites. <laughs> Got about five viewers on Twitch. I appreciate that tonight, guys. Luke Johnson says, do you know any good railroad songs? Uh, I think I can do one that will cover the railroad theme and tonight's concert as a tribute to Max. 
Um, one of the tunes that he played frequently, and I think he had a great version of it, was written about a real man who worked on the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. And uh, in one of Max's concerts, he talked about how he was very nostalgic for the old railroads, like the Rock Island Line and Denver and Rio Grande Western. And then he said, isn't it awful today? It's all Amtrak. He said, Amtrak sounds like a foot powder. Put on a little more Amtrak. <laughs> I thought that was great. But anyway, uh, this song was written in 1902 about a man named Bill Bailey who worked for the Baltimore and Ohio. I've, and I believe it was from Jackson, Michigan. Bill Bailey, won't you please come home? you please come home. <laughs> that is not uh, the Max Brath arrangement of that tune by any means, just kind of my own take. And I love the way Max did it because not only did he sing all the words, but he did it with one of the other Bill Bailey songs. And there were multiple songs about Bill Bailey. Uh, he sang Ain't That a Shame, uh, which was one of the other ones. Anyhow, um, now uh, I would like to include Two or, two or three specific composers, of course, that Max often featured, and um, uh, I would like perhaps all of you to help choose the pieces that I'm going to play. So I need to represent Scott Joplin tonight, and I have not decided which Joplin pieces I want to play. So why don't you all uh, come up with a couple of pieces by the King of Ragtime for me. I probably know about a dozen of them by heart, so you can choose from all of those. And I also want to represent Irving Berlin, of course. And um, I might do Irving Berlin first. We'll just have to, we'll have to see what uh, requests come in here. <clears throat> mm. <laughs> I'm going to wait until I see a number of requests. Uh, for the Joplin pieces to see which one maybe is the most popular among the audience. 
I wouldn't be surprised if that's maple leaf rag. Oh, got a lot of viewers on Facebook tonight. We're up to 70, 70 something. That's higher than it has been lately. Unfortunately, I don't know, um, let's see, I don't know Gladiolus Rag or the Cascades by heart. I do know Easy Winners. You know what? Because I know this is one that Max often played, uh, Loretta asked for Easy Winners. Let me play that for you. I, I particularly love the early Joplin pieces myself. So here from 1901 is The Easy Winners by Scott Joplin. so much. The Easy Winners by Scott Joplin. I hope that's familiar to uh, many people. 
Uh, it was in the movie The Sting, uh, which, ironically, Maple Leaf Rag was not. <clears throat> well, now let's go to Irving Berlin. And uh, I'll do one of the early Irving Berlin tunes, which um, Max performed many times and sang the words. And uh, this, Irving Berlin did not write the music to this. He wrote only the lyrics. It's called The Grizzly Bear Rag. Music was by George Botsford, the same man who wrote the black and white rag. So now let's do the grizzly bear, and I'll tell you more about Irving Berlin uh, in a moment. But for now, grizzly bear rag. famous by Sophie Tucker, uh, and supposedly was done with uh, a dance as well. Well, it was. It was done with a very popular dance. It was among the first of the animal dance dances that were a huge craze during the ragtime era. And Irving Berlin was um, probably better known in his own lifetime as a composer of ragtime music than even Scott Joplin. And, of course, he went on to write for so many musicals and movies that he's very well loved. Uh, this is the same man that wrote God Bless America, White Christmas, and Easter Parade. And I think it's funny to point out that he was a Russian Jewish immigrant. And uh, Irving Berlin lived to be 101 years old. And Max was one of the very few friends, uh, people that I know, that I was able to meet that actually uh, knew Irving Berlin personally. Now, he never met Irving Berlin, but they did talk on the phone. Sometime, um, oh, in the middle of his career, like in the 1970s or 1980s, Max did uh, an Irving Berlin tribute album of Berlin music from the ragtime years. And he told me that Irving Berlin called him on the phone, said, is this Max Marath? Yes, it, it, it is. Well, I want to thank you for recording my old songs and doing them the way they were written. That is, Irving Berlin apparently did not like people messing with uh, the melody when they played his music. Uh, Max always stuck pretty close to the melody. I think that's a trait of a, of a good musician. And um, so uh, it's, it's fascinating to me that Max actually got to talk to, the, to, to Berlin on the phone. Apparently, Berlin became rather reclusive in his later years and that was a special connection that he had to the original uh, composers of the period of music that I love. Now, and now, another Irving Berlin tune, this one from 1912, uh, which appeared on the album that Max did, and it's called When the Midnight Choo Choo Leaves for Alabama. <laughs>
when that midnight choo-choo leaves for Alabama. I think that's a pretty good example of the ragtime era music of Irving Berlin. Um, now let me see. Uh, I could certainly use a few more requests, maybe something else by Scott Joplin. If you, if you uh, want to hear that, let me know, folks. Oh my, thank you, Carl. Uh, if you add up YouTube and Facebook, he says there's 196 watchers. Isn't that wonderful? Thank you, folks. I need to check, um, need to check Facebook here. Hey, Bob Milne is here. Great to see you, Bob. I appreciate that. <clears throat> I don't know uh, Joplin's solace by heart, but I have seen multiple requests here for the ragtime dance. Maybe I'll play that next for you. Let's do that now. Uh, this is one of my favorite Joplin pieces, and it's one of two that he wrote that features stop time. On this carpet, it just doesn't work to stop my feet, so I'm going to skip that, but uh, this is a fun piece. It, it may date back as far as Scott Joplin's Sedalia years. Uh, the, the song version was published in 1902, and this version, the piano instrumental, came out in 1906. The Ragtime Dance. so much folks the ragtime dance yeah got in a few stomps there in the uh, YouTube chat I see <clears throat> you know one of the great things that Max would do when he was giving concerts is uh, he would display photos of the composers and uh, it occurred to me while I was busy playing the last piece that uh, Max is one of the only performers in the last probably 60 years that used old-fashioned song slides the song slides are kind of forgotten. 
they were uh, beautiful pieces of, of um, well, I, I was going to say artwork. They were photographs, uh, often hand-colored or hand-tinted, that were used uh, as, with a slide projector in vaudeville theaters, and they included the words to the old songs. They would illustrate the songs as you went along. That's why they were called song slides, and Max actually used those in his performances. Very few people I have ever seen do that, and I love them. The, the song slides were only popular for about 10 or 15 years, and then uh, they were pretty much outdated, but um, that was one of the many wonderful things he did. Um, now, let's discuss uh, one of the other composers that Max often featured, one of the most important in the world of ragtime music, and that's James Hubert Blake, Yubi Blake. And uh, Max and Yubi must have met sometime in the 1960s, and I know they became very good friends. Um, I, I don't mean to be braggadocious in any way, uh, but I don't think it hurts to tell you that Max did pass on to me a number of very special pieces of memorabilia, including all of his handwritten letters from Yubi Blake in a large box about this big, and I counted them all. I think there were 26 handwritten letters from Yubi Blake. Uh, he also gave me a huge file with all of his handwritten letters from the historian Rudy Blesch, and, I, and, and a similar file with all the newspaper clippings he'd collected on Scott Joplin over the years uh, throughout the Ragtime Revival, which is just very special. And I know that Max and Yubi were very good friends because in the letters he would always ask about Max's family, his wife, and his children. And he had nicknames for uh, Max's children. Um, and, and with that little bit said, let's go ahead and play uh, what, what is one of Yubi Blake's most popular pieces, also one of his earliest efforts, called the Charleston Rag. Now, Yubi Blake claimed that he wrote this when he was 16 years old. It's certainly possible. Um, Yubi also claimed that he was a few years older than he actually was. Uh, they had a 100th birthday concert for Yubi at the Schubert Theater in New York uh, in February 1983, and Max was the MC of the entire concert, which featured legendary musicians from around the world, and he passed on to me a cassette tape recordings of that concert, which featured such notable performers as Max Morath, Dick Hyman, John Arpin, Terry Waldo, um, William Bolcom and Joan Morris, Bobby Short, uh, and, and there's, there's so many more, I can't think to name them all. Uh, members of the cast of the Broadway show, Yubi, uh, and um, the concert concluded with a performance by Adelaide Hall, who was one of the original uh, great African-American vocalists of the jazz age, who'd been a friend of Yubi Blake. Now, all of this was to celebrate Yubi's 100th birthday. Ironically, it was only his 96th birthday. We have since discovered uh, irrefutable proof in the census records, but I don't think it matters. It's irrelevant, really. He probably wrote this when he was young, and I'm going to play it for you now. It's called The Charleston Rag. <laughs> Thank you. 
would say, that's rag time. <laughs> Charleston rag. Um, I, wish, I wish Max's daughter Kathy had been able to continue listening. I was going to tell her, if she hadn't had to leave the concert tonight, that on that tape from the 100th birthday concert, Kathy sings with her father, Max. She sings U.B. Blake's Gypsy Blues, which I will probably play for you here in uh, just a minute. Um, it's a little after 7 o'clock here, now in Durango, Colorado, and usually about this time, I do a quick announcement that I do accept virtual tips for these concerts, and it's very helpful to my career. You can send in a tip on PayPal or Venmo, and if you don't trust PayPal, there's a P.O. box on my website for checks as well. Uh, maybe I have some new listeners tonight who aren't aware of that, so uh, it's not easy to make a living playing this kind of music. In fact, I should make an announcement, and I'll try and do this twice before I finish tonight's concert, uh, what I have decided regarding the future virtual concerts. I said I was only going to do every other week for the rest of the summer, and I've decided the better way to do it is to do it month by month. Depending on how busy I am or if I'm out of town, uh, this month I could only do every other week. In July, I will probably do every week. I'm going to be able to do that, and I have a pretty good idea for my next virtual concert as well, uh, something that I have not done yet is uh, a whole evening of the early folk rags. So I think I'm probably gonna call my next virtual concert a night of folk rag time. Uh, that is, uh, for example, the music of Brun Campbell, Lest Copeland, and um, modern day composers like Trevor Tishner and David Thomas Roberts. I'm gonna do that um, two weeks from tonight. There will not be a virtual concert next Sunday night, but the following Sunday, in July, I will be doing another night devoted to early folk ragtime. Uh, if someone would do me a favor, look up the exact date so I can announce it. The exact date in July, uh, Sunday night, that is two weeks from tonight. If someone can tell me exactly what that is, I would like to announce the exact date in July. So that will be what's coming next. And in the meantime, let's do a little bit more of uh, the music of UB Blake. Yubi Blake joined with his vaudeville partner, Noble Sissel, about 1915, and in 1921, they wrote the music and lyrics for uh, the show, which was tr really the first truly successful all-black show on Broadway called Shuffle Along, and it was a huge hit. I read in a book once that uh, George Gershwin and Irving Berlin went back night after night to see this show because it was so good, the music was so wonderful. Okay, that's July 9th, folks. Uh, please, if you need to write it down, do so now. Join me again for another virtual concert July 9th and probably all of the following Sundays for the rest of July. Um, now, Shuffle Along, uh, in those days, they wrote many, many songs for every Broadway show. There were probably 15 or 20 written for Shuffle Along. I'm going to play three of them for you as a medley. And the first was the most famous tune in the show, I'm Just Wild About Harry, uh, which was originally written as a waltz. And U.B. Blake said he had to change it to a uh, foxtrot tempo to satisfy the producers. Uh, and so I will play it both ways. We'll do I'm Just Wild About Harry, Baltimore Buzz, and then the Gypsy Blues, which is uh, based in part on Victor Herbert's Gypsy Love Song. So here is a little medley from um, Shuffle Along, uh, words and music by U.B. Blake and Noble Sissel.
flash. Well, I'm going to continue with the UB Blake music, and I'm going to play you one more song from Shuffle Along. Uh, I, I like to do this one separately, and recently uh, learned this with some of the tricks off a of piano roll uh, hand played by James P. Johnson. And <laughs> the tune is not politically correct, but I'm going to do it anyway. This is uh, UB Blake's. If you've never been vamped by a brown-skinned gal, you've never been vamped at all. been vamped by a brown-skinned gal, you've never been vamped at all. From Shuffle Along by Cicel and Blake, with a few tricks off the James P. Johnson piano roll. Well, I have one more UB Blake piece to play for you. I'm not sure if I'll get to too many more requests tonight, because there's a couple of things I want to do in honor of Max, and, and be sure to get to them before the concert's over. Um, this one is one of the great, exciting UB Blake rags which was never written down until the 1970s. And uh, we know that he probably wrote this early on in his life, 19, say the 1910s or 20s probably. Um, and Terry Waldo, you know, is known as the great protege of UB Blake and transcribed many of his rags, like the Charleston rag, which had never been written down until Terry came along. But there's one that was never published until Max Morath had the foresight to ask Yubi to send him a manuscript. I asked Max about this. He said, Yubi sent him a manuscript, and uh, I believe it was published in a folio called Giants of Ragtime. This is Yubi Blake's Troublesome Ivories. And incidentally, it is not the version in the book. This is my own arrangement. Uh, it's one of those pieces that Yubi seemed to play differently every time he did it. I came up with my own arrangement for the old time piano championship. Thank you.
folks. <laughs> well, that is certainly uh, one of the great UB Blake rags, and I'm going to go ahead and leave UB behind now for a minute, and <laughs> let's go ahead and do a couple of more, uh, more contemporary pieces uh, written by Max Morath himself. And I didn't have a whole lot of time to prepare new material for tonight's concert, but I decided if there was one piece that I was going to try to play, Max wrote, that I'd never played before, this is the one that I wanted to do, and uh, this uh, is very clever. Uh, the copyright date is 1964 on this. It's melodic, it's fun. We'll see if I can play it. I'm gonna have to use the sheet music. Uh, this. It's called polyragmic, the idea being that it features polyrhythms. And so he combined it with the term ragtime, polyragmic, and that traditional oompa bass, oompa, oompa, is a little bit confused in this piece, but Max did that on purpose. Now here is Max Barath's polyragmic.
Molly Ragnick. Thank you very much, folks. Yes, it is, it is unusual, isn't it? <clears throat> Max did not write bad melodies, that's for sure. Some of the most beautiful pieces he wrote were The Golden Hours and um, One for Norma. Unfortunately, I don't know those by heart. But we're going to go ahead and do the other one that I've been playing for a number of years. In fact, I recorded two of uh, Max's pieces on one of my CDs entitled Revival Ragtime. You can get all my CDs directly from my own website, adamgswanson.com. And uh, this one, I think he wrote this somewhat later on, and he made a recording of this with full orchestra that I absolutely love. Uh, it's, it's fitting for tonight's concert. It's called One for the Road. I saw some comments here about Martin Spitznagel's piece, To the Max. Uh, that it really is wonderful. I love it. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know it by heart, and so I did not want to use that as the title of my concert either. Uh, I avoided that on purpose. It's probably a difficult piece to play. Um, well, now I thought I would do something else very special before I close out the concert. It occurred to me, uh, sometimes when I'm doing these virtual concerts, I will demonstrate my player piano. And Max Morath made a number of hand-played player piano roles. So, as a way of uh, continuing to honor him, let's let him play for us. How does that sound, everybody? <laughs> if you have not listened to my performances before, this is a 1913 Melville Clark piano with an Apollo player piano system. And the Apollo has a little bit more expression control than most regular player pianos. I do have a dynamic lever here, and I control the pedaling myself. So let's listen to some of Max's piano rolls. He made these 
in the 1970s as part of the uh, QRS Celebrity Series. QRS, of course, yeah, owned Melville Clark Pianos and is the historic piano roll company that's been around for over 100 years. It's still in business, believe it or not. Max told me, he was pretty clear about it, that he really was not that proud of these piano rolls, that they came across a little bit jerky, did not represent him at his best. But let's listen to them anyway, and we'll see uh, how much expression I can add. We'll see, as the pianolist, how good I can make them sound. So I played through a few of them this afternoon and picked two of them to play for you. And uh, I, I had Max autograph all of these roles for me. In fact, in fact, he even passed on to me his original contract with Curious Piano Roll Company from the 1970s, which I treasure. But now, let's represent two of the other uh, great ragtime composers that we have not done yet tonight. We're going to do both James Scott and Joseph Lamb. First up, James Scott's great Grayson Beauty Rag, hand played by Max Moran. Curious piano rolls about 1974 or 75. what the original roll label looked like. You can see where Max autographed that for me. Uh, the QRS Celebrity Series presents Max Marath, and he is described here uh, as the foremost ragtime pianist who was alive at the time this piano roll was made. In fact, it has the exact date here. It says, QRS presents six recordings by today's leading ragtime artist, recorded October 23rd, 1974, on the same QRS marking piano once used by the original composers of Ragtime over 50 years ago. And uh, some of my copies of the rolls are recuts. This is an original one. 
And the next one we're going to play for you is a more sensitive piece, a gorgeous one by Joseph Lamb that Max used to play. And it's, it's one of the Lamb rags which was not published during the original ragtime era. It came out uh, during the ragtime revival in the 1950s. Of course, Lamb continued composing great music throughout his whole life. And this one is very pretty. And we're going to let Max play it now. We'll see how good I can make it sound on this player piano. This is the Cottontail Rag by Joseph Lamb. I may need to make sure that I get the tracking lined up for this one. I had a little trouble with one of the uh, rolls in the tracking earlier today. Just give, bear with me a moment. I don't want to play it in the wrong key. I did that once during a virtual concert. I played my original role of Scott Joplin's Silver Swan. And I played the whole thing in the wrong key, and I didn't even realize it until after the concert was over. <laughs> now, this tracker bar probably needs to be adjusted there. I'm going to guess that's correct. <laughs>
not too bad. See, Max, I think they sounded pretty good. <laughs> Just a moment. Okay. Well, I think it's special just to play that player piano and know Max played those notes. Well, we're drawing towards the end of tonight's program, and I'm going to end with something sentimental instead of a barn burner like I often do. And uh, I think this is appropriate for tonight's performance. In fact, I think I did see a request for this. We're going to do U.B. Blake's Memories of You in honor of Max Morath. Uh, this was written for Lou Leslie's Blackbirds of 1930, a Broadway show, and uh, this is U.B.'s concert arrangement of it. Memories of You. so much folks 
uh, I have sure enjoyed playing for you tonight, and I'm sorry I didn't get to quite as many requests as I usually do, but I hope you appreciated the tribute to Max. Anyway, I wish I had thought of doing this two or three years ago. Perhaps he could have listened, but at least I got the idea to do it this week. And with that, so please join me again two weeks from tonight for another virtual concert. You can leave uh, virtual tips uh, if you enjoy this kind of music and want to support it. I'm very grateful. I think it's July 9th. I'm going to probably do a night of folk ragtime. I sure hope to see you all then. Thank you very much for all of your support. Good night for now.